All right, our, our subject matter is the value of a thankful spirit in suffering. And as I look around the audience, um, you know, each of us have stories uh, of the Lord's goodness. We've, um, each of us have gone through deep water at one time or another. I think when we're younger, we have these expectations, have expectations for our children, we have expectations for our marriage, uh, for grandchildren, for the assembly. And then um, out of left field, something comes in we're not expecting. You know, the Lord takes, takes a spouse or cancer or um, something terrible, or at least what we think is terrible, happens to one of our children. And um, how do we deal with that? And uh, so I really um, want to think with you about this, the value of a thankful spirit in suffering. By the way, there's a handout. I don't know if those are coming out. Okay, so... There's a PPT, and by the way, the, my uh, YouTube channel is on the back side uh, of the handout, and I just posted this message on that channel, so if you want to review it again, it will be up. Uh, but I thought I'd send you home with a handout from this. All right, so uh, I'm going to share with you five reasons uh, why must sorrow be ruled by thanksgiving, and the first is it's commanded. And this is one of the first things that we do when we're we don't know how to make sense of things as we go to the Word of God, and if God says do something, we just do it, even if we don't understand it. Three verses I want to think with you about. First of all, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Paul says, rejoice always, right? It doesn't say sometimes, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Sometimes you hear young people say, well, I want to know the will of God for my life. Well, whenever you see that phrase, the will of God in Scripture, God tells you what his will is. And here uh, we find out that it is God's will for us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. When I was younger in the Lord, I thought this verse meant, here is something really nasty I'm sorry, I just realized I was pointing to Travis when I said that. So you, <laughs> here's something really nasty, and um, I can find one little bit of good in that that I can praise God for. Is that what the Lord is trying to teach us? To give thanks for one little thing of what we think is good and something that we think is really bad. So our perspective is very limited. Then in Ephesians 5.20... Paul says this, give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that pretty much closes the loopholes, doesn't it? It isn't the idea of giving God thanks for something I think is good and something bad, but it, it's the idea of giving thanks always for all things. And so even in the worst situations... I am to give God thanks. We may not understand it, but that's what we're told to do, is to give God thanks for all things. If I have a loving Heavenly Father that's all-knowing, is sovereign, sees the beginning from the end, I trust him that he's working something bigger than I can understand. He says to do it, just do it. I remember Bob Brown saying years ago, Fake it till you make it. <laughs> and um, sometimes we don't feel like rejoicing in the Lord. Sometimes we don't feel like giving God thanks. Just do it. Why? Because God says to do it. And later you'll be glad you do it. Strength will come. Another verse, Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Let the peace of God rule your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Be thankful. And, listen to this, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. So when we look at a summary of these three verses, we are to be thankful in everything, for all things, in and also in whatever we do in word or deed. That's pretty inclusive. In the Exodus chapter 16, you remember the story where uh, Moses is leading the people uh, through the wilderness, and they come to Marah, and there's 
the water there is bitter, they can't drink it, and they murmured and complained. By the way, that's the highest concentration of murmuring and complaining all the Bible, Exodus 16. <laughs> their expectations weren't met, right? They were looking back at Egypt, they were looking down, making sense from their own human reasoning, and if we look down and back, we'll always be murmuring and complaining. If we look up into the character and attributes of God and look forward with anticipation of what our great God will do, we're going to go through life rejoicing and being thankful. Complainers are looking back and comparing where they are today to where they were yesterday. And so the idea is um, our complaining really is an insult to God. If he's in control of all things and everything that comes into my life has got his stamp of approval, it's gone over his desk, that means that what's coming into my life is what he has for me. That's a good way to look at it. when something really hard happens. It says, well, that's what the Lord has for me. He knows what I need. And so murmuring, complaining is really an insult to God. Paul says in Philippians 2 that we're not to do, everything we're to do is uh, to be without murmuring and complaining. Uh, disputation, I think, is the word there. So we may not feel like it. Again, it's this idea of just doing it. You may not understand it, but just do it. God says do it. You'll be glad you did it later. Strength will come. Uh, Paul says something very similar in Philippians 3 when he's been talking about pushing forward, forgetting those things that are behind. He has this upward calling. He's stretching out. He's pressing towards eternity. And he tells the younger believers, you may not understand what I'm talking about, but just run. Uh, maturity will come. Understanding will come. Just do it. And so one of the primary reasons, or the first reason, why sorrow must rule by thanksgiving is God says to do it. The result is an opportunity to, for God to exalt himself. And each of these five uh, reasons that I'm going to share with you, why sorrow must be ruled by thanksgiving, it's really an opportunity for God to do something. And uh, we want to see the hand of God in our lives to do something great. So turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. I, I'm trying to give an example of each of these concepts. And uh, Daniel chapter 6 was um, one that came to mind for the first point. Now here's the situation. Uh, Daniel was probably 12 to 16 years of age. Um, he was a Jew. He was taken by Nebuchadnezzar in the first deportation in 605 B.C. And he was hauled to Babylon. He lives through the entire Babylonian empire. He's, he's a servant, a foreigner. The, as Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied, the Medes and the Persians take down the Babylonians. And Daniel now is in his early to mid-80s. And he's, um, he's a figure that has, um, is reputable. Everyone recognizes his wisdom. And King Darius... He thinks that uh, Daniel would be a good person to make kind of a vice president. Well, others that were in the leadership of the Persian Empire didn't quite like that idea of a Jew ruling over them. And so they say this, um, Daniel had an excellent spirit, it says in verse 3, Darius was going to set him over the whole realm. And this is what Daniel's oppressors said about Daniel in verse 4. They could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. That's pretty high accolade. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. And so they devised this scheme. The only way we're going to uh, get this Daniel in trouble is if we can come up with some kind of a civil law which puts him at odds with his religious convictions. And so they go to the king and they say, oh, king, we really want to honor you, and so we want you to sign this law into, uh, sign the statute into law that for 30 days, nobody in the kingdom will ask anything but of you. Nobody will ask their God or anybody else, they'll come to you, because we want to honor you, king. And Darius says, oh, that sounds good, and he signs it into law. Actually, for the plan to work, Daniel's opposers had to know the character of both men, right? They had to know that the king and his ego would respond to it, and Daniel would not compromise, and they were right on both counts. So the, 
the law is signed, can't be changed. Daniel hears about it. He's a man of conviction. And by the way, anybody who doesn't obey the law gets fed to the lions. A little extra incentive to honor the king. So what does Daniel do? Verse 10, he doesn't run to the local law office to start um, legal proceedings, a lawsuit. He doesn't even go to the king to argue his case. It says in verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God and was his custom since early days. Let me read that again. He went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks. If that had been me, I would have been rushing before the Lord. Lord, they're out to kill me, right? As if God doesn't know all about it. Think how much time we spend praying, telling God things he already knows. I think what God really wants to hear from us is that we know him. We know his character. We know his faithfulness. We know his attributes. And then we trust him. And when his people can come before him, when nothing makes sense that they're in their situation, they come before God and they say, God, I rejoice in you. God, I, I give you thanks. That shows that we really know the God that we say we know. Daniel had an open window relationship with the Lord. If his windows were closed, if he'd opened them here, it would have been inviting persecution. If his windows had been open and he closed them, that would have been cowardice. But he enjoyed an open relationship with the Lord. He gets down on his knees and he gives God thanks. Three times that day, uh, he prayed towards Jerusalem, following Psalm 55, 17, practice of David three times a day, also Psalm 5, 7, um, praying towards Jerusalem. Now, when we read that in the text, it doesn't mean a whole lot, but when you think that when Daniel was in his mid-30s, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, you got a man here who knows his God, knows what he's going to do, and he's facing towards Jerusalem, all of the the testimony of God is in ruins for 50 years. He's facing Jerusalem, praying, waiting for the revival to come, waiting for God to renew his testimony and start it again. And so here you have a man, I think is the epitome of this uh, point. He, he's giving thanks to the Lord with this great expectation of what God will do. Well, by the end of the chapter, uh, we know the story. Daniel's thrown into lion's den. By the way, you throw an 80-something-year-old man down in a pit, that alone could kill him, let alone the lions. The next day, morning, the king comes. Are you alive, Daniel? Daniel says, yeah, I'm fine. That would be the new world translation of that, but that's, that's the idea. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine. And the fact that I'm alive, O king, proves that I'm innocent and I was wrongly accused. Daniel's brought up, his accusers are, are thrown in the pit, and they don't even hit the bottom of the pit. It wasn't a, a problem with the lions not being hungry. They broke their bones before they even got to the bottom of the pit. And by the end of this chapter, listen to this. This is what Darius, he writes this decree, goes throughout the Persian Empire. He says, he's talking about Daniel's God. For he is the living God, and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So, because Daniel chose to rejoice and, and to give God thanks in this terrible situation, his God gets exalted throughout the entire Persian Empire. We live in a society where people are anxious, worried, uncertain what the future holds, and they really need to see the joy of, of Christ lived out in those who are Christ. Just the peace of God flowing out in this joyful, 
thankful disposition settled despite a, a society that's all in turmoil. George was talking about the fellowship. There, I think he pointed out there is a definite article in 242. It's the fellowship. It's his fellowship. This is the life of Christ. This is what he shares with us, his peace. And we can relish in that. And uh, just by giving God thankfulness and rejoicing, the world gets to see the peace that's within. The second one is it demonstrates that we know God. Our brother is going to be doing a seminar tomorrow thinking about the Romans 1, how to reach Romans 1 people. Uh, you know, Paul has this court case in the first two and a half chapters of Romans. Uh, Paul is like the prosecuting attorney. God is the, on the tribunal. He's the judge. He brings three groups of people in. The first group is this natural man. And the idea, the premise for prosecution is verse 18. Um, God reveals his righteousness, and if man thumbs his nose at God's righteousness, rejects it, then God is just in judging. And so what is it that God revealed to natural man? Well, we read in Romans 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, listen to this, nor were thankful, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Design demands a designer. Creation demands a creator. The natural man looked at creation and said, I don't think there's a creator. And so they started worshiping creation. They didn't give thanks to the creator. They didn't acknowledge his presence, his authority. They rejected what God revealed. And that was evidenced by the fact that they were not thankful. The opposite is true for the believer. David says that I may publish the voice of thanksgiving and tell all the wondrous works I mean, this is the desire of the believer is to be like this megaphone to publish with thanksgiving the wonderful works of our God. In Psalm 116, 17, we read, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Sacrifice of thanksgiving. When there's something that's happened, it's, it's tragic, I don't understand it, it's, it's, um, it's put me in a tailspin, it's sorrowful. God says rejoice, give thanksgiving. And when we choose to give God thanksgiving, even when we don't feel like it, it's a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and that's what he wants. It shows him that we trust him. So in summary, to thank the Lord when circumstances dictate otherwise show that we understand his character, his attributes, and count him faithful. Beloved, when things go wrong, don't go wrong with them. Rather, rejoice in the Lord who will right all wrongs. There's nobody in this room that hasn't been offended or had something done to them that they didn't deserve. Uh, been criticized or whatever, it's okay. We just let the Lord deal with that. We're not to seek revenge, uh, avenge ourselves. We, we attend to our character. The Lord will take care of our reputation. It just shows that we trust him. So the result, why must sorrow be ruled by thanksgiving? Well, it gives the opportunity for God to do the impossible. Uh, there's a great story in um, Second Chronicles. Chapter 20, if you turn there for a moment in your Bibles, to illustrate this. Again, a desperate situation. Uh, we have this an incredible army in the Transjordan, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites. They've all gathered together, and they have combined for a force that greatly outnumbers the, the army in southern, uh, the southern kingdom in Judah. Uh, King Jehoshaphat is ruling over uh, Judah, and when he hears about this approaching army, what's he do? Verse, well, he prays. In verse 6, he says, O Lord God, our Father, are you not God in heaven? 
And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? So he starts by exalting God. Here's this mega army coming, and he starts by exalting God in his prayer. Verse 7, Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And so he's acknowledging the past works of God, his past faithfulness. And he says, And gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. And so he's claiming God's promises. You, God, gave us this land. You promised it to Abraham. And so there are just, uh, Jehoshaphat's disclaiming what God has already said he's going to do. And then in verse 12, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. I have to tell you, <laughs> Lynn, when she saw the topic this morning, she leans over, she says, is this going to be emotional? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, I think most of you know that we're going through quite a challenge with our son, Trey. Um, it's a complex situation, and by the way, please pray for us, but I don't particularly want to discuss it in great detail at the conference. I'd rather just have fellowship with you all and so forth. But he's suffering from uh, schizophrenia and some other things. And um, this, this phrase has really been a, a great hope to Brennan and I as we've been praying. Lord, we don't know what to do. Lord, we have no power, but our eyes are upon you. You've permitted this. You want this. This is what you have for us, and we trust you in it. And so this is something that has been very helpful for us to pray. And I'll, I'll say this. This is very interesting given this topic. Uh, we just went through a, two weeks of a very psychotic um, era for Trey. It was very exhausting. And there's two things that we've noticed, that when he comes back in his right mind, two things he does. He starts giving us thanks for what we do for him, and he starts serving with joy. He starts doing things without being asked. Beloved, I, I suggest to you that when we're coming into our right mind, Christ-mindedness, it's the same thing. We will be thankful, and we will serve with joy. It shows that we're coming into that right mind. Anything outside of that is not the right mind. <laughs> Maybe we're schizophrenic, too, spiritually. God wants us just to keep focused on him. We don't know the end of it. Uh, our, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Um, we have no hope but the Lord. And we certainly can't hope on what we hope will happen. It just doesn't make sense. So back to Jehoshaphat. God brings this prophet, Jehazel. Spirit of the Lord comes on him. He comes to Jehoshaphat and he says, Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. If there was ever a time in, in the, the history of the church, this is true. What, what we see out there right now is so immense, so nasty, so wicked. The mystery of lawlessness is surging. Truth doesn't matter. Reason doesn't matter. This battle is Lord's. And he's the only one who can, can win it. He says in verse 17, You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head, his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Verse 20, so they rose up early in the morning, and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord 
and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set an ambush against the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, that would be the Edomites, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Not only were they defeated, but in verse 24, they got the spoil of all the enemy. It was nothing for the Lord just to cause the enemy to fight each other and take them out. Nothing for the Lord. And then they got the spoil of the enemy. Josiah, uh, Josiah, Jehoshaphat puts the praise band in front of the, the army, right? The singers. What kind of battle plan is that? They're wa- marching out to this immense army, and they're praising God. His mercy endures forever. And God says, that pleases me. Let me show you what I can do. And he does the impossible. He takes out the army. It's a great opportunity for God to do the impossible when we simply rejoice in him and give thanks. I thought of an additional example today. Somebody mentioned Job. You know, the conversation in Job chapter 1, it was the Lord that started that conversation with the devil. What do you think about my man Job? Righteous, low sin, none like him on the face of the planet. Bill says, well, you put a hedge around him. Let me at him. I'll show you what he's made of. And the Lord says, okay, but don't hurt the man. And, and the devil comes in and wipes out his kids, wipes out all his prosperity. And Job says this, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. He blessed the Lord, Barak, means to, to thank. He gave thanks to the Lord. The Lord takes all of his children, all of his prosperity, and Job said, I do not believe that God has acted out of character. I will give him thanks. Well, that's powerful. That's a man who is in tune with his God. He understands. Well, As the trial went on, Job did accuse God of abusing his wisdom, his authority. God deals with that. By the way, there were things in in Job's heart, lurking in his heart, that he didn't know was there. God knew it was there, but Job didn't. And so the trial revealed to Job what was lurking in his heart that God wanted to purge. And so by the time you come to Uh, Job chapter 42, God meets with Job twice in a whirlwind. Can you imagine that, standing before a tornado? And God says, stand before me like a man, and I will ask you questions. (laughs) Takes twice. The second time, Job says, I know that you can do everything. I abhorred myself and repent in dust and ashes. And then we read this. The Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Incredible trial. But in the end, what was in Job's heart that needed to be purged was purged. Job was blessed twice as much as he had before. The devil was cast down, and more importantly, God was exalted. It was a win-win-win all the way through. But when you're in the midst of the trial, you can't see that. We can't see the big picture. But our responsibility is to rejoice and give God thanks. Number three, why must sorrow be ruled by thanksgiving? It invigorates our praying, which settles our minds. Colossians 4.2 Continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Philippians 4.4 4 and 6 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. And again, I say, it doesn't say that, does it? Just see if you're listening. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard 
your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Um, the word guard there is actually a military term. It's a fortification, fortify your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So in summary, those who have peace with God are also offered the peace of God. I love what the Lord Jesus does in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. On Resurrection Day, the disciples are locked in a room in fear of the Jews, and the Lord just suddenly appears in front of them. What's the first thing he says to them? Peace be with you. Remember, they, they started holding the Lord, touching him, and, and talking, and, you know, just that, that close uh, proximity to the Savior, and, and peace flooded their souls. But that wasn't the end of it. Then the Lord says again, peace be with you. And he says, and I send you forth. Through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, we get peace with God. We're restored to a holy God. But if we want the peace of God, that's a whole different matter. And we lay hold of that when we rest in heavenly places in Christ. All beneficial spiritual exercise begins when we get up in heavenly places and rest with Christ. Uh, we, we wage war against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We have no power against that, but the Lord does. So how do you battle spiritual wickedness in high places? You've got to get up in the high places where the power is at. And so all beneficial spiritual exercise begins with rest. And so if we're going to reflect the life of the Lord Jesus, we got to have his peace. The world doesn't need to see anxious, grumpy, murmuring Christians, critical people. They need to see selfless, loving, tranquil people at peace. That's the life of Christ. That, that, that's what needs to be emanated. As uh, we learned in the Bible lesson this morning, not self-focused people, but selfless giving people. People that are settled, they know where they're going. People that aren't rattled. I think of that scene in uh, Revelation chapter 4 where you have the throne room of God and you have the four living creatures flying over the, the throne calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And you have the, the Shekinah glory, the, the Sardis, the emerald, the jasper, all these different colors, a rainbow, circular rainbow around the throne, the lightning, the thunder. And... Then you have the sea of glass, not a ripple on it. Why? Because everything in God's presence is peace, and that's what we need to enjoy in the Christian life, the peace of God. So this gives an opportunity for God's peace to rule our hearts. An example of this, I thought of uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, and this is Mary, the mother of Christ, can you imagine being a teenage girl and all of a sudden an uh, angel appears before you in your home, Gabriel, and says, um, you're going to have a child, you're going to have a son. She says, I haven't been with a man. And he says, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you and you're going to have the Messiah. Well, think of all the anxiety that could have created, the uncertainty, the hardships ahead. She would be considered a fornicator. She was espoused. This is what Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. All generations will call me blessed. Instead of fretting, she chose to praise, magnify the Lord. Thought of another example, uh, more of a contemporary example with Matthew Henry. This would be probably two and a half centuries ago. He he once had a man steal his wallet, and after reflecting on the incident, he chose to, uh, to praise God about it. I am thankful that he never robbed me before. <laughs> I am thankful that although he took my wallet, he did not take my life. Although he took all I had, it was not much. <laughs> I am glad that it was I who was robbed, and not I who did the robbing. <laughs> he chose to praise uh, the Lord. Be grateful in times of distress. Um, never adapt this attitude 
it can never get any worse. Oh, yes, it can. And if you think about it, that will be an opportunity to praise God. God, I thank you that it's not worse, because it could be. And if we, if we tune our minds into thinking that way and being gra- uh, gracious to the Lord, uh, grateful to the Lord, counting our blessings, uh, it will be a defense. It will give us a, uh, a joyful uh, attitude uh, in serving the Lord. I just want to suggest that continued ingratitude towards the Lord will invariably lead to backsliding from him. You're either going to choose a life of rejoicing and praising and thanking God, or you're going to be grumbling and complaining and grieving the Spirit of God, and you'll be sliding away from him. Number four, it affirms that we want to know and be like Christ. That was mentioned already once today. Colossians 2, 6 through 7 As you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abiding in, this is the faith, with thanksgiving. So we start by coming to the cross of Christ, and then we're rooted and built up in him. It's his life and sound doctrine. It's his doctrine, his life. We're built and rooted up in him, and that should cause us to be abounding in the faith, with thanksgiving. Romans 8, 28 through 29, that's been mentioned today also, and we know that all things work together for good. we read that again. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And so God is... We're in this process of progressive sanctification where God is conforming us to the moral excellence of his son. Uh, He wants us to act like his son. He wants his life to come through us. A glorification will be uh, like the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you learn endurance if there's nothing to endure? James 1 tells us that it's through trials that God weaves in this... um, this quality of patience into our faith. So number four, the summary, rejoice in God while in hardship permits us to draw deeper into the secret of his presence. I love what Paul says in Roman, or Philippians chapter four, verses 10 through 11. He's thanking the church at Philippi for the gift that they've sent him. And then he tells, you know, I, I've really learned whether I have a lot or little to be content. And he tells him why. He says, I've been learned, but the, the word there is derived from muo. It has this idea of hands over the ears and over the eyes. It really means to be ushered into the secret or the mysteries of God. And so Paul understood that, that the trials that he had, and he had a number of them, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, he was um, received stripes five times, beaten with rods three times, stoned at Lystra, left for dead. I mean, he had a, his body was marred. He knew about suffering for Christ. And yet he says, I have been able to be ushered into the secret mysteries of God into the secret presence of God. These things that you could never lay hold of naturally by by eyes or ears, I've been brought into the intimacy of God. I know God in a way, I've experienced God in a way I would have never before experienced if it hadn't been for the trial. So he writes this in Philippians 3. Paul's in prison. He says, Rejoice in the Lord. We are the circumcised who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, that I may gain Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul says it doesn't matter Whatever the Lord has for me, I understand that it's really an opportunity for God to show himself and bring me into his presence, his secret place, under his wing, experience him in a way I would have never been able to before. Is that worth it? Is that worth it? 
It's a hard question to answer, isn't it? Because it's pain, suffering. But God says, if you want to know me in a way that you don't know now, let me bring you into the secret, the mystery. Hudson Taylor, a great example of this. Now, this is going to be an eye test on the... Um, I wanted to have the information in the PPT if you look at it later, so I'll read this to you. Um, Hudson Taylor was a pioneer missionary into China. I think it was about 1850 when he first went in, pioneered the China Inland Mission. At one time, he had over 1,000 missionaries that he was overseeing. He married, his first wife was Maria. They had seven children. They sent the oldest four uh, back to the UK for schooling. Um, two of the other children died in China, and when the seventh baby was born, it died shortly after birth. Maria contracted cholera, and she also died shortly after birth. So the situation is this. His, Hudson Taylor's four oldest children are on the other side of the world. Three of his children are buried in China, and his wife is buried in China. This is what Mrs. Duncan wrote. She was an eyewitness to Maria Taylor's homecoming. I never witnessed such a scene as dear Mrs. Taylor was breathing her last. Mr. Taylor knelt down, his heart so full, and committed her to the Lord, thanking him for having given her and for the 12 and a half years of happiness they had had together, thanking him, too, for taking her to his own blessed presence and solemnly dedicating himself anew to his service. Hudson wrote this, For my inmost soul I delight in the knowledge that God does or deliberately permits all things and causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. I saw that it was good for the Lord to take her, good indeed for her, and in his love, he took her painlessly, and not less good for me, who must henceforth toil and suffer alone, yet not alone, for God is nearer to me than ever, and now I have to tell him all my sorrows and difficulties, as I used to tell my dear Maria. And that's something... Shortly after this great trial of faith, Hudson wrote Mrs. Berger, no language can express what he has been and is to me. Never does he leave me. Constantly does he cheer me with his love. That's what's to be gained. When the trial comes, the crushing load comes, to, and we don't understand it, and it, it's broken our hearts. I'll, I'll share it. I have never shared this before with anyone. My wife and I, we, we try to pray every day, sometimes more. And it's been so long since I've seen my wife pray without crying. And for a long time, I was so, it grieved me to see her tears. It just grieved me as her husband. And then I started thinking, wait, this is what God wants. He counts them. He, he puts them in a bottle. He loves brokenness. And the spiritual realm, brokenness is a premium to God. It's what he wants to see. When we come to the point where we can't do anything, we say, God, it's, the, the enemy is too great. I have no strength, but our eyes are upon you. Uh, I think that's sweet to the Lord. And he says, let me show you more myself. And so he brings us in. And you, we get to experience God uh, in a way that we never did before. And it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see the screen. <laughs> All right, number five. It reckons that suffering must precede glory. Romans 8, 18 through 25. For I consider that the sufferings of his present time are not worthy to be compared with glory, which shall be revealed in us. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait 
for it with perseverance. In the, the Greek, there really is this idea of cheerful endurance, uh, joyful expectation. Uh, we eagerly wait. We're, we're hoping. We understand that suffering must precede glory, and, and we're waiting for it patiently. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. And the idea there is we don't go into cardiac arrest. Uh, we don't fate. We don't give up. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is for, but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen, we must know the invisible reality of God's presence. So in summary, if indeed we suffer with him, Christ, we may also be glorified together with him. So the result, an opportunity to obtain eternal glory, suffering would be most miserable if there is no God. I feel so sorry for the atheists. They suffer with no hope, no purpose in it. But we who know that there is a sovereign God who loves us, who wants the best for us, we understand that when suffering happens, God has a purpose in it. He's going to exalt himself. He wants to do the impossible. He wants to draw us into his presence. He wants to refine us. He wants to show us the depravity in our heart. Example of this, I, I thought this would be a great way to close our evening, is just thinking about our Savior. On the way to Emmaus, not the college, but the town, uh, the Lord is talking to two disciples. And I would have loved to listen to this Old Testament survey. Mark says he, he changed his form. Luke says he hold, held their eyes. So they didn't understand it was the Lord. He's given them an Old Testament survey. And the Lord says this, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Luke 24, 26. Turn with me to Psalm 118. We'll end our evening with a lovely devotional thought from the Word of God. Now, on Sunday before the crucifixion, what we often refer to as Palm Sunday, it was Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He comes down the the Mount of Olives, and the people are putting palm branches before him in their clothes, and they're, they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that comes out of Psalm 118. So I know this psalm was on the Lord's mind that final week. Then on Super Tuesday, he includes part of the psalm in a parable, and then right before he takes the disciples up to uh, the Mount of Olives to give the Olivet Discourse, He's looking over Jerusalem, and he's weeping. He's weeping over Israel's rejection. How I would have gathered you as a hen would have gathered her chicks under my wing, but you would not. And he refers to Psalm 118 again. So I know this psalm was on the Lord's mind. Now, Matthew tells us that before they left the upper room, they sang a hymn. Now, if they followed the Jewish tradition of the Hallel, which is, they would have sang Psalm 113 to 118 during the Passover. That means that Psalm 118 would have been the last hymn that the Lord Jesus may have ever sung in, during his earthly ministry before he left the upper room. Okay? And we know this psalm was on his mind through the week, on Sunday and on Tuesday, and then again, most likely, um, the night before his crucifixion. Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is a day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Often we sing the praise chorus, right? This is a day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We sing it word perfect, but it's not the context that Scripture brings out. The day that is being talked about here, it speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ specific day in human history, the most important day. That's the day that the Lord has made. He, and then he says, uh, verse 25, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. In verse 25, the two words, save now, save, yasha, 
now, na, yasha na, yasha na, in the Greek, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 27, God is the Lord, and he has given us light. And listen to this, beloved. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Can you see the Lord Jesus singing this song? Bind the sacrifice to the altar? It was him. He was the sacrifice. And he says, you are my God and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. This is an example of our Savior. It's one that we should follow. We're only here on planet Earth for one reason. Paul puts it in Ephesians 1, he says, for the praise of his glory. We're only here to make God look good. We're only here for his glory. Anything else from that doesn't count for anything. And so our attitude in suffering is going to be immense declaration to the lost world who desperately needs to, needs to know who Jesus Christ is as to his character and who he is. It declares to him. And so if the Lord Jesus uh, could do this and set this example for us, we, we should follow the same example. Yes, there's a time to suffer. He will honor us. He will glorify us. Our light affliction is for a moment worketh for us a far more eternal weight of glory, seeing eternal weight of glory. Glory has a weight to it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that in the resurrection, he says, look at the stars. Some are brighter than others. So shall it be in the resurrection. Some saints will shine brighter than others. It's the reflective glory of Christ. What we do in this life carries into eternity. Suffering precedes glory. I thought this was a great quote by CHM. Actually, my wife shared it to it. She reads uh, his treasury almost every night before she goes to bed. She says, this is a great quote. I read it. I said, it's a great quote. Anyone who by his own hand would seek to take the edge off of present suffering and reproach proves that the kingdom is not filling the vision of a soul that now is more influential with him than the hereafter. That's good. Anyone who by his own hand would seek to take the edge off of present suffering and reproach proves that the kingdom is not filling the vision of a soul that now is more influential to him than the hereafter. Thankfully, we have the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. He's able to sustain. He's able to refine and bless and reward each of us in every difficulty that he has chosen for us. Whatever you're going through, God has chosen it for you. It's what he has for you, and we just need to rest in that. So in summary, when we were thinking about why sorrow must be ruled by thanksgiving, it really is to enjoy the rich opportunities that God affords us. Point one, it is commanded. And as we choose to give God thanks, God has the opportunity to exalt himself. Secondly, it demonstrates that we know God. And God works the impossible. It invigorates our praying, which settles our minds, and God's peace rules our hearts. It affirms that we want to be like Christ. We enjoy a higher experience with God. Get to be ushered into the secret of his presence. And number five, it reckons that suffering must precede glory. We receive eternal glory with Christ. And I believe it's worth it. Father, we thank you for being with us this evening, speaking to us through your word, through your spirit. Um, none of us are perfect in this matter. We're learning. Lord, I pray that you would teach us. I pray, Father, that you would usher us deeper into the presence of yourself, that we might understand you, experience you, know you, that your greatness would be evidence in our life, that your peace 
would rule our hearts, that we would just choose to be a people that are, are thankful, rejoicing in you, and knowing that that is, uh, even though we may not understand the circumstances, we rejoice in you, and you're a good God that does good. And so, Father, this evening, we just want to close our, our time by saying we love your son. We, we ache to be with him. Please give us every opportunity and capacity to exalt his name while we have the opportunity. We ask in his name. Amen.